I think the worship team got saved this week. Well, as that song so aptly illustrated, we're in a series called The Road to Recovery, and we've been looking at how we handle our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups that seem to be messing with our lives. We are taking the word recovery, R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y, and each week we are looking at a different letter that represents eight steps that help us get unstuck from the habits that mess us up from the hurts that would cause us difficulties, from the memories that hang us up because we can't seem to let them go. And what we're wanting to do is to move from stuck to starting over. The first week, and by the way, if uh, you haven't heard any of the previous sermons, they're at the website. You can go and you'll find them listed there and you can get caught up. The first week we talked about the reality step. That's the first R in the word recovery. And it stands for realize that I'm not God. That's a reality step. Realize that I'm not God. I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong things, and my life is unmanageable. In reality, I realize I have a problem I can't seem to control. The second week, we looked at the second step, and it's called the hope step. And it, uh, it's the letter E in the word recovery. And although I'm powerless to control all the problems and all the things in my life, God has the power to control them. And the E stands for earnestly believe that God exists, that we matter to him, and he has the power to help us recover. Last week, we talked about the third step. It's known as the commitment step. You see, it's not enough to know that I've got a problem, and it's not enough to know that God can solve them. The C in recovery is that we consciously choose to commit all my life and all my will to Christ's care and control, and finally say, God, here's my life. The good, the bad, <laughs> and the oh-so-ugly. And now God begins to work on them. Today we're going to look at step four. Step four is known as the house cleaning step. It has to do with cleaning up the past and letting go of the guilt. It's about understanding what Paul meant when he said in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. A clear conscience before God when we look in a mirror and we stand before others. It's learning to live a guilt-free life. Some of you are working very hard at living a gluten-free life, but you may be failing miserably at a guilt-free life. And that's the way God wants us to live. If we will take this step, we're going to be a whole lot better a week from today than we are today. So the O in recovery, the fourth letter, it stands for openly examine and confess my faults to God, to myself, and to someone that I really trust. Some of you might be asking, why is this a part of recovery? And I think the number one reason that this step is essential to recovery is because guilt is the biggest culprit in keeping us stuck in a rut. Guilt is what keeps us from growing a healthy spiritual life. Guilt keeps us from becoming all that God desires us to be. If you're going to learn how to really enjoy life, you've got to learn to let go of the guilt. You see, we all have regrets. We all have remorse. We all have things we wish we could turn back the clock and say, Who I wished I had done that differently. But we didn't. And so we feel bad. We feel guilty about it. And we still carry it with us. As a result, this guilt we carry around, sometimes consciously, but I would suggest to you, quite frequently unconsciously, it creates problems for us. There's a lot of ways that we react in life that are caused by this conscious and unconscious guilt. Things that we're not even aware of, we simply feel bad about. You see, we often try to deal with guilt in a variety of ways. One, we try to deny it. But guess what? It's still there. <laughs> 
You, you can deny that you're overweight, but it's still there. You can deny that you're getting old, but you are. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, it's denial, isn't it? Sometimes we deal with guilt through repression. We, 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 we just push it down deep. But guess what? When stormy waters comes, it resurfaces. Sometimes we deal with our guilt by blaming other people. It's their fault. It's never ours. Sometimes we excuse our guilt, but we know there's no excuse. Frequently, we rationalize our guilt, <laughs> and that is so irrational. We, we feel the effects of it. Whether we deny it, repress it, blame others, excuse it, or rationalize it, we still feel the effects of it. So if we're really going to recover from the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups in our life, we've got to learn to let go of guilt. And how do we live with a clear conscience free of guilt? See, mounting guilt eventually will become an avalanche of condemnation, and eventually it buries us. Years ago on a radio talk show, the, they had a call in to a psychologist. And somebody called in and said, I'm so consumed with guilt, I don't know what to do. How do I get rid of it? And the talk show, answered, the talk show host answered, you can't. You've just got to learn how to live with your guilt. When I hear things like that, I want to scream. Give me that guy's number. I know a better answer, a far better answer. Rationalizing is telling myself in my mind that it's okay when I know in my heart that it was wrong. And we can rationalize all we want. It's okay. Everybody's doing it or whatever. It was a long time ago, but in my heart, I know it was wrong. Well, when I was at the Fresno Bible House back in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a popular book that came out on the public market which says, I'm okay. You're okay. Everybody's okay. And the fact is, no, we're not. We're all a mess. Some of y'all are a hot mess. How do we get rid of this guilt? It's by taking step four on the road to recovery. And the good news is, the good news is, this step is the key to relief. This step is the Alka-Seltzer of biblical recovery. Do you guys remember Speedy? Blop, blop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. <laughs> I love that commercial. It is so cool. <laughs> and if you take step four, you'll be able to experience exactly what Speedy was talking about, that commercial. But it's not Speedy who brings it. It is God. And David wrote about it. If anybody understood guilt... And the problems it creates, it is King David. And if you don't know what I'm talking about there, then show up Wednesday night at Mark's class. And you're going to find out all about King David and why he was a professional when it comes to understanding guilt. And he wrote in Psalm 32, What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What relief for those who have confessed their sins. And God has, listen to this, cleared their record. Ooh, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. So, the reason for the step, number one, the reason for the step is because of what guilt does to us. The reason this step is important is because of how destructive guilt is. Let me illustrate. Number one, guilt destroys our confidence with Christ. You will not be confident in forgiveness if you are still carrying guilt in your life. It makes us feel insecure because we're always worried. What if somebody finds out what I did? What if somebody really knows the truth about me? They may not like me. They may not let me volunteer. They, they, they might reject me. I may not be all that I'm cracked up to be. As a result, we're afraid of other people, and that destroys our confidence in God. Many years ago, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Does that name sound a bell familiar to y'all? He's the guy who wrote the uh, Sherlock Holmes novels. He was quite a prankster. And one day he played a prank on the five most prominent men in England. He sent an anonymous note to the five prominent men and the note simply said, All is found out. Flee at once. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm glad he wasn't my friend. <laughs> Within 24 hours, all five men left the country. You see, guilt robs us of confidence in Christ's sufficiency. It's like this cloud hanging over our heads, and we're thinking, I just can't get on with life because I'm afraid somebody's going to find the skeleton in my closet, that deep, dark secret that I know about and obviously God knows about, but so far nobody else knows. It is a heavy weight, and it robs us of relief. The second bad thing that guilt does to us is it damages Most of our relationships, if not all of them. Guilt causes us to respond to people in wrong and inappropriate ways. Guilt makes us impatient with other people. Guilt can cause us to overreact in anger. Have you ever known somebody who could really blow up? They made a mountain out of a molehill. It's kind of like a nuclear explosion to a firecracker cause. It's often motivated by guilt. Number three, guilt can cause us to spoil people, to indulge people. I I feel guilty for what I've done, so I buy people things. I give them things. I do things for them. Parents often feel guilty, and they overcompensate by indulging their kids. Have you ever heard the term Disneyland parent? It's usually because of guilt. Guilt can cause us to avoid important commitments particularly in relationships. We will get so close, but then no closer. We play the porcupine dance. We get close, and then we stick out our quills, and we drive them away, and we we do this dance. Why won't I let people get close to me? Often, one of the key reasons is guilt. Many marital problems today are caused by things that happened before they ever got married. Three, Guilt keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt is kind of like driving your car and constantly looking in the rearview mirror. You're more worried about what's behind you that you never can go forward. You'll end up crashing. You see, guilt cannot change the past just like worry cannot transform the future. It just makes us miserable today. And misery often leads to illness. There have been a variety of reports over the decades of doctors and psychiatrists who say that probably up to 70, listen to this, that probably up to 70% of the people in a hospital could leave today if their guilt was resolved. That is huge. You see, I know that when I swallow my guilt, my stomach keeps score. And if I don't talk it out to God and others, I will take it out on myself. This fourth step is very important, and and, and it's a very scary step. This is one that separates the men from the boys, and, and probably I shouldn't be sexist here. So let me phrase that differently. This is what separates heroes from cowards. This is the one that separates those who just want to talk about recovery and those who really mean business about transformation. So how do we do this step? Five-step process. Let's hit them. Number one, we must first take a personal moral inventory. Now, this is the process that everybody who participates on Thursday night in Celebrate Recovery goes through. What I've been explaining to you is this is everything they do. Now, you don't have to go to a Thursday night or a Monday night or a Tuesday night Celebrate Recovery to do this. It won't hurt you if you do. But you think you don't have to think, well, I'm not going to go to Celebrate Recovery, so I don't need to do this. If you struggle with guilt in your life, you need to do this. Whether you go to a Celebrate Recovery or not, you need to celebrate your recovery. And the only way to get to a point where you celebrate your own recovery is really to do this process. Train's coming through. (laughs) Number one, take a personal moral inventory. What that means is, is you need to find a time and a place to get by yourself. Nobody else around and shut your cell phone off when you're doing this. Okay? Get by yourself, get a pencil and a notepad and sit down And ask yourself and God these questions. What's wrong with me? 
I did tell you you needed a pad of paper, right? Don't take a single page. You need a pad. What is wrong with me? What is it that creates this guilt? What do I have regrets over? What do I feel remorseful for? What are the faults in my life that I need changing? And ask God to reveal to you the issues that are keeping you stuck. Ask him to bring to your mind what are the things I consciously feel guilty about? What are the things that I unconsciously feel guilty about that I'm not wanting to deal with, but they're messing up my life? We have biblical direction for this. Some of you are saying, Tim, this sounds like psychological babble. No, this is biblical truth. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 4, 40, 340. Let us examine our ways and test them. God says there needs to be personal examination of our lives, and we need to pray and trust God for this process. And then David, he writes in Psalm 139, 23, and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything you find in me that makes you sad. Lord, I'm sitting here. I've got my pencil and my paper. You just bring it to mind. Take your time. Don't rush. This doesn't work unless you are ruthlessly honest with yourself. Quit pretending. Sit down. Start writing. Some of you are saying, Tim, I've heard you make speeches about journals before. Why do we have to put this in writing? Because it forces us to be specific. Why can't I just think about them and pray about them? Thoughts disentangle themselves when they pass through our lips and our fingertips. That means if I've thought about it and I can say it and I can write it, I've got it clear. If I can't say it, if I can't put it down, it still is kind of vague and nebulous. You can't just say, God, I've blown it in life. We all know that. Specifically, we need to write it down. This helps us be specific. Face reality. It helps us stop denying problems in your life. Now, now I want to give you a couple of warnings. This first warning is this. Step number four is not, is not a step that gets us right with God. We've already done that. The step, when we get right with God, we can say, God, I've sinned and I want you to come into my life. <laughs> Blankets covered all of our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven all of our sin. This is not about the right relationship between us and God. Step number four is about the relationship with ourself. Step number four is coming to grips with what it is that God has done on my behalf and me appropriating what he's done for me. This is not about me becoming a Christian. This is about me taking the next step to grow as a Christian based upon a clear understanding of what God has done. And we need to understand that self-effort in this area will open the door to the evil one to run amok in our life. Dependency on Christ is an absolute for this process. And I'm going to tell you this about three or four more times before we come to an end. When you finish this step, destroy that paper. When you finish this step, then burn that paper. Most of you have heard my comments about personal journals. If you want a journal, great. Before you die, destroy them. Your family doesn't need to read all of that after you're gone. And because you left it behind, somebody will. And it will probably create more damage than it will good. Destroy it. Step one is take a moral inventory. Step two, accept responsibility for that inventory. Accept responsibility for your faults. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. The greatest hold up to the healing for my hang-ups is not you. It's me. The greatest hold up to the healing for your hang-up is not me, it's you. It starts with being radically honest and saying, I'm the problem. We keep saying, if I could just change relationships, if I could just get a new job, if I could just move to a new town, if I could just find a new pastor, then everything would be fine. No. Because the problem with all those scenarios, of all those new things in your life is, you'll still be there. It's you. 
and it's me. We need to accept responsibility for our faults. Don't rationalize. Don't say it happened a long time ago. Stop saying everybody does it. Don't minimize it. Don't say it's no big deal. If it's no big deal, then how come you still remember it 20, 30, and 40 years later? Don't minimize it. Don't blame others. It's mostly their fault. It might mostly be their fault, but God holds you responsible for what's your fault. It may have been mostly their fault, but what about yours? Admit you messed up. The scripture says in the Phillips translation, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Excuse me, that's the NIV. The Phillips translation says, we live in a world of illusion. (laughs) And the Living Bible says, we're only fooling ourselves. The point is this, if I really want to stop defeating myself, I've got to stop deceiving myself. Pretending that it's everybody else's fault when the issue really is me. What are you pretending to not feel guilty about, but in your heart you still do? Don't you think it's time to finally deal with it, get over it, so you can move on with life? You make a moral inventory, you look at the list and say, yep, that's me. It's my fault. That brings us then to the third step, which is a really good one. Thank God for his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, if we freely admit that we've sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly clean from all that was evil. If we admit it, God forgives it. What is the right way to ask God for forgiveness and how do I do this? Let me first of all talk about the wrong way to ask for forgiveness. Oh, there is a wrong way. Number one, don't beg God to forgive you. Don't beg God to forgive you. God wants to forgive you before you ever ask for it. You don't need to beg him. Makes it sound like that he's stingy with his forgiveness. And he's not. God wants to forgive you more than you want to ask for forgiveness. You don't have to beg. Number two, don't bargain. Any of you ever bargained in prayer? Don't say, God, if you'll just forgive me, I will never do this again. (laughs) If that's your area of weakness, you probably are going to do it again. So don't bargain with him. God accepts you right where you are without begging or bargaining. And, And last of all, don't try to bribe God. You ever done that one? God, if you'll forgive me, I'll promise I'll go to church, even on Super Bowl Sunday. God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise you I'll tithe. God, if you do this, fill in the blank. Okay, so Tim, what do we do? This is the beautiful simplicity of the grace of God. The same thing that got you out of hell and on the road to heaven is the same thing that gets you out of the mess of guilt on the road to victorious Christian living. Believe. When the children of Israel left Egypt, what did they have to do to leave Egypt? They had to believe what God said. God said, step into the Red Sea and believe. And when they stepped in the Red Sea, what happened? Waters parted. And then the children, I I don't know if you remember this story. Maybe I'm going to do a series on this down the road again because this is is really such good imagery out of the Old Testament. Uh, Egypt is a picture of sinfulness. The promised land, Israel, was a picture of a victorious Christian life, not heaven. Not heaven the promises of God to their fullest. Do you realize it was only an 11-day journey from Egypt to the Jordan River? And it took Israel 40 years. Why? Because they didn't have the same amount of faith that God could take them in as they had that God could bring them out. And there are a lot of Christians today who are stuck because they had enough faith to believe that God could get them out of hell and into heaven, but not enough faith to believe that the God of heaven would leave heaven and come live in them on earth so they can live a life that God promised, a life that he said will be more abundant with peace, joy, rest, and contentment. So the prayer 
in this step is the same as the prayer in the step to get out of sin and into Christ. Just believe. Admit he is who he says he is. And agree with God. Just agree with him. The basis of forgiveness is that he's utterly reliable. It is God's nature. Some of you are saying, no, but Tim, if I make a list, you don't know what's going to be on that list. I mean, it is really ugly. Uh, folks, I'm only a man, and I'm only a pastor. And trust me, there's nothing that any one of you could ever share with me that would shock me anymore. Because there are others sitting on pews here who've already told me those things. Not about you, but about them. And you know what? I still like them. And if God is able to do that in the life and the heart of just a man... Think about how God deals with that in his own heart, in his own life. It's amazing. A while back, a woman went to her pastor and said, Pastor, I'm depressed. I've been in bed for weeks. I don't have any energy to get out. I don't want to live anymore. As he began to talk with her, he said, is there something in your life that you really regret? And she said, oh, man. My husband travels all the time. I was lonely, and after a while, I, I, I had a very brief affair. And in that very brief affair, I ended up pregnant. And I, I, I then had an abortion, and, and, and I never told him. And the pastor explained to this woman how Jesus Christ had said, I can forgive you and cleanse you from every sin. And the woman said back to the pastor, but pastor, that's not fair. Somebody needs to pay for my sin. And that wise pastor looked at her and said, somebody has. His name is Jesus. The debt's been paid. We humbly come to God and we say, God, thank you for your forgiveness. Isaiah wrote in chapter 1, verse 18, no matter how deep the stain of your sin is, I will remove it and make you as clean as the freshly fallen snow. Somebody has classified that verse, Isaiah 1, 18, as the soap bar verse or the detergent verse. You see, detergents brag about how they can take out deep stains from our garment. And God says, no matter what the stain, I'll wipe it away. A few years ago, rumors spread that a certain Catholic woman was having visions of Jesus. The archbishop decided to check it out. And he said, is it true, ma'am, that you have visions of Jesus? And she said, yes. And he said, well, the next time you have a vision, I want you to ask Jesus to tell you the sins that I confessed to him at my last confession. And please, call me first if it happens. Ten days later, the woman notified her spiritual leader of a recent, recent apparition. Within the hour, the archbishop arrived. What did Jesus say, he asked. And she took the bishop's hands in her hands, and she gazed deeply into his eyes, and she said, Bishop, these are his exact words. I can't remember. And that is exactly what God says to us. And remember, when you finish this process of inventory, and you finish the whole process, what are you going to do with that piece of paper? Burn it! Destroy it! Why? Because that's what God has done. Number four, admit my faults. This is to one another. An absolute essential. It's in the Bible as well. James 5, 16. Admit your faults to another. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. How are we healed by admitting our faults to somebody else? Why do I need to drag another person? Why can't I just admit it to God and be done with it? Why don't I just pray and make a list and tell God? Why do I have to tell at least one other person? Here's why. Because at the root of our problems is relationships. Guilt often hampers all of our relationships. We lie to God, we lie to each other. We deceive each other, we deceive God. We dishonest with each other, we try to deceive God. Why? We wear masks. We pretend we've got it all together and we don't. We deny our true feelings. We play games. It isolates us from intimacy. We play the porcupine game. And then we end up sick. Somebody once said, I'm only as sick as my secrets. The secrets I hold on to are the secrets that make us sick. The more we hide, the bigger it gets. We, we, we exaggerate it internally, but the amazing thing is when we risk with one other person, all of a sudden, whew, a sense of freedom comes into our life. We realize that everybody has problems, and often they're the same ones we have. We admit to another person, everybody needs at least one. You don't need more than one, but you need at least one in your life. Guilt and its fears shrink in the light of Christ's love. Darkness exaggerates our problems. Light exposes them. 
So some will tempt, do I just go out and broadcast to the world? No, please don't. No, don't tell the wrong person. That's big trouble. Don't just go out indiscriminately and tell your problems. Ten years ago, Las Vegas experimented with a call-in connection confession line. It was a line where people would call in and confess their sins to a recording. America's first confession line makes this possible for a fee of $9 for three minutes. Record your sin, and if you want to pay a little more, you can listen to other people's sins. <laughs> Apparently, the service was being bombarded by calls. One of the originators said it's a technological way to get something off your chest without the embarrassment that comes from confessing one-on-one. -on -one. But do you know what it really is, <laughs> besides a moneymaker? It's confession without accountability. So who do you tell? Number one, somebody you trust. They must be able to keep a confidence. You don't want to tell somebody who will run off to the National Enquirer in 48 hours. Number two, somebody who understands the value of what you're doing. A pastor, a staff, an elder board member, a participant in Celebrate Recovery. Somebody who's mature enough that won't be shocked. And number four, somebody who knows the Lord very, very well. Don't, don't go tell somebody who just got saved last week. Find somebody you can trust. Then what do you say? You find a safe place. You take that list, that moral inventory, and you say, here's all I need. For, I need you to listen to my list. I don't need comments. I really don't need questions. I just need you to listen, and I need you to pray with me, and I want you to kind of be my accountability friend through these next several months or maybe even years. You don't have to tell everybody, but tell somebody. Be specific. The secret you want to conceal the most is the one that you need to reveal the most. It's the one that needs an application of God's grace. And when do you do this? A-S-A-P. Because you've waited long enough, haven't you? <laughs> you've been procrastinating this long enough. This is one of those things that you're going to go home from today's sermon and you're going to say, you know, i got to i got to think about what pastor said for a while today. i gotta, I, I got to think this thing through. No, you don't. <laughs> you need to do it. You need to do it. Last of all, accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God wants to forgive all of us. The last two Sundays, I've had people walk up to me after various services and say, Tim, you stood right in front of me today as you preached that message. Tim, did my wife call you this week? <laughs> those, those are true. Those are comments. No, and I didn't design this for you because all have sinned. We're all in the same boat. And we all need this step of recovery. When we come to God, it's not that God just says, not guilty. What God says to us is better than that. God, on the basis of the sled blood of Jesus Christ, declares us forgiven. Forgiven. He forgives us instantly, freely, and completely. I want to draw your attention to the screen. We're going to go about five minutes over today, but what's new? I want to show, this, this is a brief testimony, all right, from someone who's been through all the steps of Celebrate Recovery. And so I want you just to get a sense of a little bit of what takes place. Let's. My name is Pony. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'm in recovery for codependency, self-doubt, and overeating. I was blessed to grow up in the church, but as a young adult, I turned away from God. We moved from Minnesota when I was in my teens I was resentful at my parents and at God for leaving my friends and my life behind. That's when I started making really bad choices in my life, hanging out with the wrong crowd. In my early 20s, I got in a very abusive relationship, which was both verbally and physically abusive for many years. My codependency began when I thought I had tried to fix him. Eventually, I grew even further from God and began to run for food for comfort. 
Since attending Celebrate Recovery and working on the 12 steps and the eight principles, I now have a better understanding of who I am in Christ by doing a spiritual moral inventory along with forgiving those who have hurt me and make amends to those who I've hurt. Along with my CR sponsors and many accountability partners, God is healing me from my overeating and now I run to God instead of food. I'm down 85 pounds by the grace of God. God has blessed me with a loving husband, six children, and four grandbabies, and a new life in Christ. Now God uses me to help others in hope and Jesus Christ to celebrate recovery. I have so much more to my story and hope you can hear my full testimony at Celebrate Recovery on a Thursday night right here at New Hope CR. Thanks for letting me share. Amen. And Pauline and her husband, Brett, are the leaders of our Celebrate Recovery program. And I hope you noticed right in the heart of that, she said, I did a moral, personal moral inventory. Let me wrap this up. Commitment to that which is convenient will not do in recovery. Courageous commitment to do whatever it takes is what's a necessity for recovery. Often a lifetime is spent attempting to untie and untangle the problem knots that simply need to be severed. Um, any of you know what I'm talking about when I say a casting fishing reel and pole? Any of you ever get a bird's nest? You know what I'm talking about? All right, for those of you who don't, that is when you cast and something goes wrong and all of the line just bundles up in a big old mess of that. I have watched my grandfather try to untangle that. The cost of the knot, the line amount of line that's used in that big old knot is probably two or three cents. And I've watched fishermen take hours trying to untangle the mess when the best thing to do is cut the line and start fresh. That's the kind of commitment involved here. And we need to do that ASAP. Let me close with a story. It's a perfect illustration. This is true, by the way took place in a logging camp several decades ago in Oregon. In order to transport logs from the top of the mountain to the river below, the loggers constructed big, large wooden chutes. They would cut down a tree, strip the limbs, then place the huge trunk into the chute, slide it down to the river. By the time the logs reached the river, they were traveling very, very fast. They would hit the water, and then they would float down to the mill. The loggers used those wooden chutes to save time. They would often go from the top of the mountain to the bottom, down the chute. Rather than walk around the mountain to get to the bottom, which would take a long time, they simply would place their axe in the chute, and they would ride it like a wooden stick, horse stick, down the chute. It was very exciting. One day, a logger slid down the chute on his axe handle. And as he attempted to bail out of the chute before he reached the bottom, when he stood up, he slipped. And his foot became lodged in between two of the large planks that made up the chute. It was wedged in tight. As he struggled to pull his boot out, and he heard the yell from up above, indicating that a huge trunk was on its way down. In desperation, he struggled harder, but there he stood, foot caught in the planks, huge logs speeding toward him, and all he had in his hand was an axe. He was stuck. And the only way out required courage from within. This man had the courage to cut from his life the only thing that stood between him and death. And he axed off his foot, and he jumped free in time to save his life. Most would have died trying to untie a boot that never would come free. Attempting to untie and untangle the mess that has caused most of our tragedies will end up in continuing the cycle of destruction, depression, defeat, destroying all of our ability to live freely. There comes a time when a person must say, 
I have drunk enough. I have eaten too much. I have bought far beyond what is necessary. I have been angry way too long. I have been the victim far, far too long. It is time to take step four. Let's pray. Our Father, there are some in this room who have never ever taken step four in their life. They've been a Christian for years. But they've walked in guilt all those years. This may be a day of freedom for them. There are others, Father, who we've taken step four for many things in our past and who you've just dug deeper into our life and revealed to us we have another reason to take step four again. I pray that we'll do this without delay. I pray we will do this and make a courageous step so that by this day next week, we'll be a much different person than we are today. In Christ's name, amen.